Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here to talk about work we're doing with um, mapping some allosteric signaling in my favorite protein, which is plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which we lovingly call PI1. So PI1 is a key regulator of fibrinolysis, or the enzymatic breakdown of fibrin clots. So when you form a, you, when you form a blood clot, you, then you want it to stay along, around long enough so you can have wound healing, and then we want that clot to go away. And that's primarily done by this enzyme plasmin. That's the activated form of the zymogen plasminogen. And plasminogen is activated by two prote serine proteases, UPA and TPA. And PI1 is a stoichiometric inhibitor of UPA and TPA. So it's putting the brakes on this fibrinolytic process. So we obviously care about PI1 because it's really important for helping regu regu regulate hemostasis, but it's also been implicated in a lot of other pathways as well. So high PI1 levels are associated with inflammation and infection. It's an acute phase reactant. It's also been linked to metabolic syndrome, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension, as well as fibrosis. And for a lot, a lot of these pathways, the mechanisms by which it, it impacts these pathophysiologies isn't known. There are, there's, a rare, there's a rare population that has a PI1 deficiency, and that complete PI1 deficiency pre presents with a mild to moderate bleeding phenotype. And it's been reported that haplotype insufficiency in this population is associated with increased longevity. Again, the mechanisms are still being determined. So PI1 is a member of the serine protease inhibitor superfamily of proteins, or serpents. They're found across all kingdoms of life. And serpents are classified in this family based on their protein fold. So they have this reactive center loop. It's in yellow. It extends from the core of the protein, kind of like a ballet dancer with its arms above, it, above their head. And the center is this central beta sheet. And the reactive center loop, or RCL, contains an amino acid sequence that's the primary amino acid sequence that the protease that's trying to inhibit wants to cleave. So the protease is going to attempt to cleave that reactive center loop. It's going to, it's going to get to the acyl intermediary stage, so they're covalently linked. And then the RCL does a throwdown where it, they both go under this conformational change. They're covalently linked. And what I should say is in that active ballerina form, it's, it, the serpents are in this metastable conformation. So their functional conformation isn't actually their lowest energy state. All right. So we've really gone, done a deep dive looking at different functions of PI1 using DMS. And so we use a phase display system, so pretty straightforward. And in this case, we're going to look for its ability to inhibit UPA and, screen, and, just, and identify variants that way. And so as you can imagine, we generate a very rich data set when we do this. So red here is loss of function variance. They no longer inhibit UPA. It's, primary, it's, it's target of inhibition. Blue are going to be our functional PI1 variants. And so we were interested in looking how conserved this UPA function, is, inhibitory function is, because there's all these pathologies that PI, high PI1 is associated with. So. And so what we did is we did a conservation score at every position, and we also did a did a score, our DMS score at each position, summing up the number of functional mutations. And so the higher our conservation score here on the y-axis is, the more um, variation we see across extant species. And you can see that correlates really well with our screen. So we conclude from this that even though PI1 is associated with all these pathologies, there is an evolutionary pressure to maintain its ability to inhibit UPA. And then human, and so like, likewise, human mutations that make PI1 unable to inhibit UPA are underrepresented when we look at the NOMAD database. So remember I said PI1 is, exists in this metastable active conformation. It's actually really unique among the serpent family of proteins because it actually will transition to its, lower, its actual lowest state energy conformation in the absence of a proteolytic event. It's very unique to PI1, and we don't know what the mechanism of this, the reason behind this latency transformation is. But this is what it looks like. So in the absence of a proteolytic event, that reactive center loop is going to insert into that central beta sheet. And now we have a version of PI1 that's no longer inhibitory. I'll just let the movies finish playing. Okay. And so we then did a DMS screen looking for this. And we did the same screen with our phage display library. But we're going to let this, so we let them sit for two days at 37 degrees. So the half-life is about one to two hours of the wild-type protein. 
And so we assume things that were going to be that are likely to go late in that time we would no longer pick up on our screen. And so we do see a lot of red here, but a lot of that red is the loss of function variants are just variants that were probably misfolded from the get-go to not inhibit UPA. So when we subtract those out, we get a much simpler looking um, heat map. And when we map those real, those blue regions where we can have lots of amino acid substitutions that allow pi one to have this prolonged half-life, they map out to these regions of the protein that I've highlighted here. And since I think I'm the only person in the room that stares at pi one all day long, um, I'll let you look at this movie again. Those are actually the regions that have the most flexibility, the most movement in these molecular dynamic situations, sim simulations. So what we think we did is introduce variants that basically made pi one more rigid in those regions and therefore less likely to undergo that conformational change. So we did the same type of analysis looking at comparing across extant species of so these conservation scores, and we actually see the opposite trend that we saw with UPA. So remember, we set the screen up to look for pi-1 variants that were longer lived, that were more functionally stable. And so the regions in our screen that actually accepted the most mutations to make it more functionally stable were actually sites where, where the residues are going to be highly conserved if we look across extant species. And so we assumed that there's actually a pressure to maintain that latency transition, maybe hypothesizing that it's, it exists so that we can get rid of these pathological effects of pi-1 in its active state, but we don't really know what that latency transition is for. And again, if we look at NOMAD, the human mutations that make pi-1 more functionally stable that we were selecting for in our screen were, are, are still un, are underrepresented in NOMAD as well. All right. So, that, so pi-1 is, a, there's a little bit more to this latency transition story. So pi-1 circulates in the plasma. It's also found in platelets, and it does so in a one-to-one in -a -one stoichiometric complex with its protein cofactor vitronectin. And vitronectin binding to pi-1 stabilizes pi-1 in the active conformation by about 50 to 100 um, percent, prolonging the half-life. And so we know from crystal crystallographic studies that the SMB domain of vitronectin binds here on pi-1, and yet it's stabilizing this reactive center loop that's all at the very far end of pi-1. So there's clearly some mechanism by which we're transmitting signal across the protein. And so about 10 years ago, our collaborator, Dan Lawrence at UMICH, he had, he was trying, there was a, he was wanting to find inhibitors of pi-1 because it's obviously involved in his pathologies. And so through a small molecule screen, they had identified this molecule CDE096, and they, and they located its binding site here, which is 40 angstroms from the vitronectin binding site. It, CDE096 inhib, prevents pi-1 from inhibiting UPA, and it also reciprocally inhibits vitronectin binding. So, if CDE096 is bound, vitronectin has a lower affinity, and if vitronectin is bound, CDE096 has a lower affinity. So there's a reciprocal re relationship, and you can actually see that there's changes in the structure of those active sites. But the mechanism by which that signal was getting transmitted wasn't understood. So if we think about allosteric in this case in terms of a perturbation at one site in a molecule, and then the signal propagation. We don't. This idea of how the signal gets propagated is something we're still really trying to understand. But how, however the signal gets propagated, there's going to induce a change at distal regions of the protein. So in order to get at this looking at, vit at this vitronectin binding, we set up a parallel screen of our phage display system. So we're always going to look for UPA inhibition, so we're only going to select for variants that are actually functionally active. And in a parallel screen, we're going to take full-length vitronectin, so not just that cementinum B domain that's been crystallized, and then identify variants where there's no, they're no longer able to bind vitronectin. So we're going to assume if there's, a loss of, if, if there's a loss of vitronectin binding due to an amino acid substitution, that that's a mutation that is somehow ablating that, that binding interaction. So that site is critical for that interaction. And so this is the data we get out from our UPA screen, our vitronectin screen. And then we get a much simpler data set that looks for residues critical to vitronectin binding. So they're shown in red here. You can see there's some places where if we put any mutation in, basically vitronectin no longer binds. And there's some other sites where there's going to be some mutations that one or two mutations that may ablate vitronectin binding. So what we did is we map those onto the structure. So these are the, our most highly significant amino acid residues in the screen. And the darker the blue is the more mutations we identified at that site that ablated the ability for vitronectin to bind. And this matches up really well with a lot of our um, pre-existing knowledge about how this interaction should work. One, the, 
the majority of our mutation of our sites are right where we knew the vitronectin um, SMB binding site was. So that matches really nice structural data that we, that we had. We also knew that two of our most significant hits had six or seven amino acid substitutions that ablated the vitronectin binding affinity, um, our arginine 101 and glutamine 123. And this is already a variant that people make so that it will, if you make these two mutations here, you'll actually stop vitronectin from binding at all. In some previous functional studies that were done about 30 years ago, um, so DMS screens done in the early 90s, essentially, there was a, a glutamine, one, so glutamine 55, which is on the back side of the protein, was identified as being essential for vitronectin binding, but through some long range um, interactions that weren't, we didn't, under, we didn't have an understanding of, it was before we even had a crystal structure. And in our screen, we actually identified two, in this part of the screen, we identified two more amino acids in this region that are critical for binding. Um, it's also been postulated that, so in addition to the SMV domain, that some unstructured regions of vitro, full length vitronectin um, interact with these two arginine residues, and we picked those up in our screen as well. And finally, um, aspartate 193 is known to form a salt bridge to help ease the um, transition to latency, so making it easier to go over this little hump that it's on the end of. And we also picked that residue up on our screen. So it seems like there's interactions happening at the complete other end of the molecule that are disrupting vitronectin's ability to bind. So then, finally, so then the last thing we did was we want to see how are these connected. So we re reduced the stringency of our screen and looked for any site where there were three amino acid substitutions that may more weakly um, diminish pi one's ability to bind vetronectin. So those are shown here in light green. And what you'll notice is they'll start at the known binding site. They work their way up the back side of the molecule with this glutamine 55 site up through where the CDE096 binding site is. And so we think that these inhibitory functions of PI1 and its latency transition under purifying selection and that there's a network of amino acid residues to help to um, convey the vitronectin signal upon its binding to PI1. And so that I'd like to thank our group. I'm happy to have people come to my poster, but I'd really like to call out Shisti Bate in our lab, who also has a poster tonight looking at a, a bacterial modifier of the plasminogen activation system. Thanks. Thanks very much. OK. Quick question because we have um, the pitches. We're mm -hmm. going to get through them. You can be found later as yeah. well. So, any quick questions now? Feel free. I didn't mean to put you <laughs> off. Well, maybe it's better if yeah, they no. come and see you yeah. later. So, anyway, thanks. Thank and we've got loads to ask people. <laughs>